you know what? I don't like an elbow landed in my ribs. That's weird. Uh, let's try this one more time. Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. I'm Shanta Grimes and this is Ninja Riders. And today I thought I would spend a few minutes talking to you guys about something that has been coming up quite a lot in my Ninja Riders classes, which is show versus tell. So if you are a fiction writer, you've probably heard the advice to show, not tell. And maybe you're not 100% sure what that means. Maybe you feel like you know what it means, but you're struggling to know how to make it work in your writing itself. So today I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk with you with my daughter, Adrian, who is an aspiring writer. Uh, so you can listen in while I help her understand show versus tell. And then I'm gonna switch to a screen share and I'm going to edit a page of her work for show versus tell for you so and talk you through it so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, we're gonna start right now. Okay guys, meet my daughter Adrienne. Hello. And her little little dog Mo, who's our <laughs> office dog. Um Adrienne, let's talk about show versus tell. And tell me what you think you know about show versus tell. Um, I know it's important in fiction writing that you <laughs> show rather than tell. And I know that I struggle with it because a lot of my writing is like academic or nonfiction. And I think that there's less of a, a need for yeah. Well, even in nonfiction, show versus tell is important. Mm -hmm. Let's start by defining show and defining tell. So showing means that you are writing in a scene. Um, the hallmark for writing in a scene is that you have dialogue. So either spoken dialogue between two people or interior monologue, which would be unspoken dialogue inside your character's head. And telling is exposition. So it's narrative about what had already happened, has already happened. So it's the difference between me inviting you out to lunch today and you going with me, and that would be showing, and then, or me telling you tomorrow about the really amazing lunch I had yesterday, that would be telling. Okay. So you can tell if you are in scene or if you are writing your writing is showing rather than telling if you have dialogue mm -hmm. or interior monologue. Most of the time, if you are in scene, you are going to have some sort of interior or exterior speech. Okay. Should you always show versus tell? No, that's a great question. <laughs> no, you shouldn't because it's exhausting to read that. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be like watching a movie like The Fast and the Furious, Furious or something where it's all um, car chase all the time with no break, no, um, it would be exhausting, right? And then also you might end up in that case repeating a lot. So let's say that you have a character who is I don't know, an accountant and so maybe one day or one scene you need to show them at work but you don't necessarily want to have like go into detail and go into scene every day that they go to their accounting job because that would be a boring read mm -hmm. um so sometimes you can show something once and then when it's repeated you can just tell that it's happened over and over again um and sometimes you have some information that the reader needs to know but it's not pertinent to the story at that moment mm -hmm. other than the reader needs to know it and rather than have like maybe it's something um but like that the main character is not going to be there for so maybe they get on a phone call with someone or someone just tells them like this happened uh, which leads me to my other point that it's really easy <laughs> to sneak telling into what actually is a scene. So just because you have dialogue does not mean that you are not telling mm -hmm. because you can write a scene where you and I um, are 
like driving into work together and I'm telling you in dialogue all about my lunch yesterday and it's still telling. So even though there's dialogue and it's a scene, um, the information that's being put across is still telling. Where I run into an issue with show versus tell is when I, I think that I really like to write interior monologues. Like I like to get into my characters' heads and I always feel like when I get comments that I'm telling rather than showing, it's it's in those interior monologue scenes. So how, like, what is the line between... So are you sure you're an interior monologue and I you're not... I think I am. So um, in a, uh, the next part of this video, I'm going to um, screen share and um, edit a page of your work in progress and so that page will have some of that interior monologue and we'll look at it mm -hmm. but generally my best guess would be that you're not actually an interior monologue you're just um like the main character so if you are in a scene and your character has interior monologue it's going to be something that they would actually be thinking in that moment mm -hmm. so it wouldn't necessarily just be the main character thinking about exactly what you need the reader to know because um, like for instance if you are uh, writing a scene and somebody is um, getting I don't know just doing anything you might not necessarily have them it would be telling for you to have them think about like what they look like just because you need the reader to know what they look like <laughs> and um, even if that's like you write it as if it's going through their head if they wouldn't actually be ha thinking through a mm -hmm. really in-depth um, personal like um, mo monologue about their looks <laughs> that, like they you know if they wouldn't just be sitting there like driving to work in the morning thinking I'm five foot six and uh, I weigh 150 pounds and I've got brown hair and, and you know whatever like if they wouldn't be thinking that then it's still telling, even if it's written or couched as interior monologue. Mm -hmm. So you, interior monologue is something that a main character would be, or a character, it doesn't matter if they're a main character or not. It's something that a character would be thinking, like actually thinking in the moment, you know, in the scene, right at that moment in time. Otherwise it's telling. Okay. What other questions should I ask about show versus tell? What do you think? What do you hear come up? But I feel like it comes up like if you're using a lot of I, like sentences that start with I. Yes. So the one problem that I see often and is a uh, show versus tell is so important that it it's like practically every part of revision. Mm -hmm. But sometimes telling comes out as it reads like a, a laundry list or stage directions. You know, I, I um, sat down at the table, I cut my sandwich in half, I took a bite. You know, it, it reads like a list of things that, that are happening. And um, when it would be like, rather than I sat at the table, I cut my sandwich in half, I took a bite, which is a list of tells, you could say, um, you know, I sat at the table and took a bite of my sandwich, which is, or, or you could say, um, you know, man, this is a great sandwich. You know, my teeth sunk into the, um, crusty bread and the juicy turkey or whatever. Yeah. Like, um, that is, uh, showing. Mm -hmm. So would you say like a good way to tell if you are telling and too much in a story because sometimes I feel like it can be hard for a writer to see if they're telling too much but like is a good rule of thumb if you're using too many I statements well um, they're not I statements or, yeah. Yeah, but send if you're what you're reading if you're showing if you're in scene your writing is going to have like emotional impact Everything that you write should do at least two things. Uh, one of those things is move the story forward. So every single thing, every word, every sentence, every scene should move the story forward. And it should do something else. So if all it does is impart information and that's it, it's not, you, you're not in, in, you're not showing, you're not writing in scene. The, the scene, need, the what you're writing needs to give us, you know, 
something about the character, character development, setting development, story development, and move a story forward. Mm -hmm. So two things at least. It can do more than two, but it should never do less than two. Because if it only moves the story forward, it's probably, you're not, you're not putting enough into it. That's I'm going to link in the description to a article by Chuck Palahniuk um, that is absolutely my favorite article what's like ever. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, he calls them thought verbs. Uh, and it's a little scary <laughs> when you read it, it's a lot of work. Um, but it's the heart of it is show versus tell. So if you tell me that you felt something or you tell me that you heard something or that you saw something, you know, um, I heard the birds outside my window. That's telling. Mm -hmm. Birds chirped outside my window. Yeah. That's showing. Um, I, you know, I hate broccoli. That's telling. Broccoli is bitter on my tongue. That's showing. So when you find yourself using, like for, and also some of it is just we, we write fast. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you just use the easiest thing like the easiest word to tell. And for me, and everybody's different, I think, but for me, I use the word felt a lot. Mm -hmm. So I felt whatever. And I have to go in and search my manuscript when I'm done for the word felt so I can open that out in from telling to showing. Mm -hmm. So what did it, you know, what did it feel like? Don't tell me that you felt it. I Your reader needs to feel it too and so that means you need to let us know you need to let the reader know what it felt like or what it looked like what are or, some other like popular telling words that people use besides like felt um so a lot of times i see uh on a sentence level a lot of times um, and this is another one that I have, to, it's on my own personal style guide, like my list of things that I look for in revision, using an ING verb with a to be verb. So um, she was running, um, then that's telling, she ran, that's mm -hmm. showing. Um, so that's one. Uh, and it's also just stronger. But the reason it's stronger is because it shifts the the writing. A lot of people think that that is, I hear sometimes, I hear people that call that passive. It's not actually passive. Um, she is the subject and she's running, so she's mm -hmm. doing something. It's just that she's not um, doing it in a very strong way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's much stronger to say she ran mm -hmm. um, than she was running because it's closer to showing than telling. So ing verbs. Ing with pair, yeah, which is usually paired with a to um, a to be verb. Mm -hmm. A could is another one. So um, he could hear the birds outside the window is telling the birds outside the window chirped or woke him up or you know banged into the glass or whatever mm -hmm. kind of story you're telling is um it, and it's also interesting to note that if you say he could hear the birds outside the window that doesn't mean anything it, mm -hmm. like you could hear them chirping their pretty little morning songs or mm -hmm. Um, you know, fighting to the death, or are we talking about the movie birds here and they're like swarming the house? It could be anything. So uh, it, it's not um, that, you know, it's a sign that, that it's not strong enough and that you're, you're telling something rather than showing it. And I don't feel like how does the, how do the birds outside his window, like how is that affecting him or how is it important to the story? Is it like a case of like, yeah, like I was just going to say like if you have to like, you have to, you have to make sure that everything you're putting in your story is like driving it along and, and it has to move the yeah. story forward and do something else as well. So, uh, he heard the birds outside the window might um, move the story forward if he needs to hear the birds. If he, if it doesn't, this is another rule of thumb. So if it doesn't even move the story forward, like if there's no reason for him to hear the birds outside, it doesn't do anything and it, it doesn't move the story forward or develop anything, mm -hmm. then it's a line you should cut. And if you really love it, it's probably a darling and you should still cut it. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, we'll do another video soon about prologues because it ties, my thoughts on prologues are similar to my thoughts on um, whether you need to have anything in your story. That's a good one because people always freak out about prologues. Yeah. I have, I have thoughts about <laughs> prologues, but the, um, like a good rule of thumb for all of your writing is if I take this out, is the story still going to make sense? And if the answer is yes, you should probably lose it, right? You should probably should cut it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not enough that it's well written. It has to serve the story as well. And um, what are some things that I can do when, as I'm like writing my, like how, how much should I worry during my writing my first draft about whether or not I'm showing versus telling? None at all. You should just get your first draft is, should just be about getting that, you know, that stuff out on the page. And um, although it, it doesn't hurt to learn about it um, now so that, because it'll make your revision easier yeah. if you're at least aware uh, that of where those scenes are. But my first drafts, I, I've written, I don't even know how many books, 10 or 12 or more books. Um, I've had four of them published by major publishers and I still, my first drafts still have telling and I have to go in and open those into scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often, I, this is another thing I see often when I'm workshopping Ninja Rider students, mm -hmm. is that often what happens is as you're writing your first draft, you tell something and then you go on to beautifully show it. Or the other way around, you show, you write this great scene and then you just reiterate it and you tell it at the end. So you'll tell the whole party and at the end you'll have the main character say, and we went to a party last night. And um, that's something that be aware of, that it happens to every, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to say every writer, but every writer I know, and I know a lot of them, it happens. And you just need to be aware of it and be a way, be able to find where you've done that so that you can cut it out because you don't need to tell and show. And if you've shown, you definitely don't need to tell. You, you can cut that out of your story. And it's really common to tell it because you haven't written the show scene yet, so you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you write the showing scene, and when you go through and revision, you can take the telling part out. And, and there's, um, I mean, there's other, my, my favorite writing, um, like editing exercise is from Dave King and Rennie Brown's book, Self-Editing for Fiction Writers, and it's called Rue, or Resist the Urge to Explain. I use that one a lot when I'm giving feedback on other people's writing. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a lot, you know, like if you're writing a description, I don't know why human brains just like things in threes. I think that it's really common to, to describe the same thing in three different ways. And no matter how well written all three ways are, and they could be perfect, like, stunning mm -hmm. and they still weaken each other um, if you if you say it more than once they you start to get diminishing returns so um, usually you need to cut two of them and just have one solid strong beautifully written description rather than um, you know it was cloudy outside the mist mm -hmm. was thick I could hardly see two feet in front of me. Like, you don't need to describe it three ways. That's not beautiful writing. <laughs> That's off the cuff writing. But, um, you know, you don't need to say it three times. It just pick one, and that's it's stronger that way. It has more punch. And the same goes um, for, that's on a sentence level, but sometimes you have a whole paragraph that just, you know, you've already described something, and we don't need the rest of this. It, it's buried. It gets the really good descriptions or the really good writing gets buried under all of the stuff that you should resist mm -hmm. the urge to explain. Um, and then, and I've even seen it where there's like a whole chapter that if you cut that chapter, it's not going to affect the story at all. Mm -hmm. And if you cut that whole chapter, it's not going to affect your story. And you should at least consider doing that. If, if you find yourself with, especially if your manuscript is too long, but even if it's not, mm -hmm. um, if you have any part of your writing that's, that doesn't move the story forward, that is not necessary, and that if you cut it, it's not going to affect 
the reader's experience of your story, it's almost guaranteed that if you cut it, it's going to make your story tighter and stronger and more concise. Okay. Um, would you say that, because I feel like, um, you know, when I write my first draft, I'm tell I'm telling a lot because I'm telling myself the story. So if somebody were to like, if like I were to adapt having like a, a zero draft into my writing process, like would that cut down, would that be like a good way to cut down um, on the telling in my official first draft? I think it would. There's lots of different definitions of a zero draft. The way that I do them is just to tell myself the story so it reads like a synopsis, maybe an expanded, longer synopsis. So um, I always write a zero draft in third person, present tense, no matter what, what um, point of view or tense my story is going to be in when I actually write it. And I just tell myself the story. So um, in, a, in a less showy, more telling way. And then I have something to work off of. So we can do another video too about um, zero drafts because they're one of my favorites. I actually have a whole book about them. So we will link to that in the description as well. But uh, yeah, I think that that could be a good and also, if any part of your book sounds like a synopsis. So synopsis should be telling. Synopsis tells the story. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's very telling versus a, um, you know, a manuscript. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> I am going to go to my computer and Adrienne is going to send me a page of her no novel and I'm going to screen share it and record my editing process on Adrienne's page so that you guys can see what I mean by show versus tell. So we're going to do that right now. That's good. No, it's just your butt is in the frame. Really, Mom? Hey guys, it's Shanta again and I am looking at a page of Adrian's story. I think her working title is Birdie. And I'm going to read it and then we're going to go over it and edit it, particularly for show versus tell. So I'm just going to read it the way it is out loud for you first. Where's your head at, Birdie? The sound of the ocean just feet away from my sand covered toes held my attention more than my do doting father sitting next to me on the oversized beach towel. The sunset was close to reaching completion with pinks and reds fading into purples and deep blues. It sure was beautiful here in Tamarack. I'll give it that. Too bad it had to be the most boring town in America. Probably up in the clouds and halfway back to Portland, I replied. We had been in Tamarack for two months now and I hated it. I hated the always salty air, the humidity that never let my impossibly curly hair lay flat at all. The everyone knows everyone small town vibe and the lack of anything to do on the weekends. I mean, the beach was nice and all, but there's only so much fun a girl can have by herself in this glorified seaside truck stop town. The lack of city sounds is what really drove me crazy, though. It took me a good month to adjust to sleeping without the sound of the freeway and the homeless men that hung out on our street in Portland. Funny how you miss the things you say you never will as soon as they're gone. Well, I hate to say it, but I think it's time to turn those wings around and head on home, little bird. There's nothing waiting in Portland for us anymore. My name is Bridget Masters, but dad has called me Birdie for as long as I can remember, and the nickname has stuck. It doesn't bother me. Bridget sounds like a 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. This is a YA urban fantasy novel. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Where's your head out, Birdie? The sound of the ocean just feet away from my sand-covered toes held my attention more than my doting father sitting next to me on the oversized beach towel. So this whole, let's see if you guys can see this, this whole opening sentence after the dialogue Adrian has dialogue here. It's definitely a scene, but there is a lot of telling in it. Um, 
and also what I'm noticing is a lot of really thick, big paragraphs and that should be broken up. And sometimes the dialogue is lost in the par paragraph. So actually let's start by breaking up some of these paragraphs. I think that this little line here should be its own paragraph. I think that this line of dialogue should also be closer to by itself. And I would probably break this one up there and here. Um, okay, that's better. Can you see how the white space there, it's just already reads, like it's an easier read for your eyes with the white space. The sound of the ocean just feet away from my sand covered toes, you need a hyphen there, held my attention more than my doting father sitting next to me on the oversized beach towel. So I wonder if dad couldn't do something here so that we understand that she's ignoring him without being told. So, so what if it would, so where's your head at birdie? I would like to see some sort of an action beat here. So one, we know who's speaking and also we get the, the idea of the attention not being on the dad in a way that's more showing than telling. So, you know, an elbow landed in my ribs and I looked up, right? I looked up from the ocean, lapping at my feet, just lapping, no, lapping just feet, just yards away from my toes, right? And then maybe she responds, so like, geez, dad, right? And then he might answer her back, like, seriously, where are you? And then, so then we can cut all of this, right? And we can, I like this description of the sunset. So the sunset was close to completion. We don't need the word reaching. It was co close to completion. I would probably break this sentence up here with a period. The sunset was close to completion. Pinks and reds that faded, not fading faded into purples and deep blues. It sure, I think I actually might do this paragraph right there. It sure was beautiful here in Tamarack. I'll give it that. Too bad it had to be the most boring town in America. So let's, okay, probably up in the clouds and halfway back to Portland. So if we move this dialogue up to that, thoughts, which is interior monologue about Tamarack and how beautiful and boring it is, then we can have this dialogue without the dialogue tag. Anytime you can get rid of a dialogue tag, in my opinion, is a good day. So you want to not have a dialogue tag unless it's absolutely necessary. So it, was, it sure was beautiful here in Tamarack. I'll give it that. Too bad it had to. I don't like I'll give it that. It's kind of like a breaking the fourth wall in a way. I think I would just leave that off. It sure is beautiful here in Tamarack. Too bad it had to be the most boring town in America. Probably up in the clouds and halfway back to Portland. So cutting, I'll give it that, is kind of a resisting the urge to explain. Like we already know it's her thought. We're pretty deep in her point of view. Um, and you just you don't need to tell us that she's giving it to us because she just said it. So she's given it to us probably up in the clouds and halfway back to Portland. We're gonna attach that to that line above. We've been in Tamarack. I'm gonna, I happen to know this is in Oregon and I think I wanna know that here. We've been in Tamarack, Oregon for two months now. Um, so here's an example of what we were talking about of um, telling something, I hated it. And then going on to share, show the hatred. So I'm going to cut this so you can see what I'm talking about. We've been in Tamarack, Oregon for two months now. 
rather than say I hated this always salty air, we could do this, right? So the air was always salty, was always salty and humid. It never let my impossibly curly hair lay flat at all. So here we have the everyone knows everyone small town vibe and the lack of anything to do on the weekends. So this is a good example of um, another example of resisting the urge to explain and also showing versus telling, right? You don't need to tell us there's nothing to do on the weekends because in a few of lines here, we're going to find out that there's only so much fun she can have by herself. So I don't think you need to tell it here. So. The everyone knows everyone's small town vibe. How did it make her feel, right? How about was claustrophobic? The everyone knows every, oops, I spelled that wrong. The everyone knows everyone's small town vibe was claustrophobic. I mean, the beach was nice and all, but there's only so much fun a girl can have by herself. So we've already... I'm going to cut out the word glorified here because I don't know what, what it means. I don't know why it's there and it's, and it pulls me out a little bit. So I mean, the beach was nice and all, but there's only so much fun a girl can have by herself in a seaside truck stop top truck stop town. The lack of sounds so I don't even know if we need, is that what really drove me crazy? If, I think if we just say the lack of sounds though, because that feels like interior monologue to me, like what you might think in your head. The lack of city sounds though. Took me a good month to adjust to sleeping without the freeway. So we don't want sound here, right? Because you first of all, it's twice and um and I in this paragraph and also just don't think you need it. It took me a good month to adjust to sleeping without the freeway and the home. And so like maybe the chatter of homeless men of the homeless men that hung out on our street in Portland without the buzz of the freeway. So, you know, do something to describe the sound buzz or, or um, some other word, it might not be buzz. It took me a good month to adjust to sleeping without the buzz of the freeway and the chatter of the homeless men that hung out on our street in Portland. Funny how you miss the things you say you never will as soon as they're gone. I love that line. Well, I hate to say it, but I think it's time to turn those wings around and head on home, little bird. There's nothing waiting in Portland for us anymore. I um, I know there's only dad and birdie talking here, but I still would kind of like a little beat from him right here um, it, to control the pace, right? Um, of, of this dialogue and I don't know if you need the word well I hate to say it no I like well well I hate to say it but I think it's time to turn those wings around and head on home little bird dad stood stood up and shook out his towel something like that there's nothing waiting in Portland for us anymore my name is Bridget Masters. Um, so last name here is weird. My name is Bridget, but dad has called me Bertie for as long as I can remember. Um, I don't think you need on the nickname stuck because it's been as long as you can remember. If it's been as long as she can remember, it's clear that it's stuck. So my name is Bridget, but dad has called me Bertie for as long as I can remember. 
it doesn't bother me. Bridget sounds like a 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. Oh, like the 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this. It doesn't bother me because I don't know why it would bother her. So you might want some, some, you know, I don't know. I'm curious if other people call her birdie Do the, you know, her friends at school call her birdie. Do her teachers call her birdie or only her dad? Did her mother call her birdie? Um, I don't know. I kind of, when you're going over this, Adrian, I kind of want to know why it would bother her in the first place. So it doesn't bother me. That's a tell. And I don't know why you're telling me that information. So I kind of feel like I wouldn't put that there and I would do something else. My name is Bridget, but dad has called me Birdie for as long as I can remember. You know, maybe either... So has everyone else. Or I wish everyone else would as well, right? I wish everyone else would too. So either, so so is everyone else. You know, thank God. Bridget sounds like a 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. Or I wish it, other people would too. Bridget sounds like a, the 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. Okay, that's it, you guys. Let's read this all the way through one more time with the changes, and then we're done. Where's your head at, Birdie? An elbow landed in my ribs, and I looked up from the ocean, lapping. You know what? I don't like an elbow landed in my ribs. That's weird. Uh, let's try this one more time. Where's your head at, Birdie? I looked up from the ocean, lapping just yards away from my toes. Geez, Dad. Seriously, where are you? The sunset was close to completion. Pinks and reds faded into purples and deep blues. It sure was beautiful here in Tamarack. Too bad it had to be the most boring town in America. Probably up in the clouds, halfway back to Portland. We had been in Tamarack, Oregon for two months now. The air was always salty and humid. It never let my impossibly curly hair fall flat, lay flat at all. Everyone knows everyone's small town vibe was claustrophobic. I mean, the beach was nice and all, but there's only so much fun a girl can have by herself in a seaside truck stop town. The lack of city sounds, though, it took me a good month to adjust to sleeping without the buzz of the freeway and the chatter of homeless men that hung out of, on our street in Portland. Funny how you miss the things you say you never will as soon as they're gone. Well, I hate to say it, but I think it's time to turn those wings around and head on home, little bird. Dad stood up and took, shook out his towel. There's nothing in waiting in Portland for us anymore. My name is Bridget, but Dad has called me Birdie for as long as I can remember. So is everyone else. Thank God. Bridget sounds like the 50-year-old divorcee in every rom-com ever made. All right, guys, that's it. I hope that that helped you to see what we we're talking about, what I was talking about with regard to show versus tell. Have a great day. Bye. That's good. No, it's just your butt is in the frame. Really, Mom? Where's your butt?